Well, good evening, folks. I am glad that you're here. And to our family online, I'm glad that you're here with us as well. We've been starting off every service with everything's all right in my father's house. Let's start out that way tonight. Everything's all right in my father's house. In my father's house, in my father's house, everything's all right in my father's house. Where there's joy, 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 oh, come and go with me to my father's house, to my father's house, to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house, where there's joy, 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 and come and pray with me at my father's house, at my father's house. At my father's house, come and pray with me at my father's house, where there's joy, 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 and everything's all right in my father's house, in my father's house, in my father's house, everything's all right in my father's house, where there's joy, joy, joy. You believe that tonight? I thought you did, and all as well. You were handed a song sheet on the way in. And the first song we're going to start with tonight is Some Folks May Ask Me, Some Folks May Say, Who is this Jesus that you talk about every day? We're going to sing that chorus twice, all righty? And let's hear you sing it out. Some folks may ask me, some folks may say, Who is this Jesus that you talk about every day? He is my Savior. He set me free. Now listen while I tell you what he's done for me. He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything. Is he? Both great and small. Come on, folks at home, sing. Gave himself for me. Made everything new. He is my everything. Now, how about you? He is my everything. He is my all. Is my everything, both great and small. He gave himself for me, made everything new. He is my everything. Now, how about you? I just love that song. Our songbook only has the chorus in it. And so that's why I gave you the rest of the words tonight. We're going to sing another song in a little bit. But I'm glad you all are here. Let's have us an opening word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for a wonderful Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful medium where we can still meet with our people, even though they cannot necessarily be here. And I would ask you now, Heavenly Father, please meet with us tonight. I thank you so much for giving us such a marvelous service this morning, for meeting with us like you did. The presence of God was so obvious in this place. And I thank you for it. And I ask you to do it again tonight, Lord, if you would, so that we can grow once again. Our faith can become stronger like it ought to. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, just a few announcements, as I always bring just a few. Uh, first of all, you good folks who are online with us tonight, that little button down there that says share. I noticed there were five shares this morning, so thank you so very, very much. And uh, if you'll share this with your friends and on your timeline, that'll be a blessing. So please go ahead and hit that. And that way other folks can share in what you enjoy as well. And I know you enjoy it because that's why you're here. Uh, so please hit the share button if you would, please. And then also our service times. Don't forget Sunday morning at 1045, Sunday night at 6 o'clock. And our midweek Bible study on Wednesday is at 7 o'clock in the evening. And so you'll want to be here for all of those. We just, by the way, finished up our uh, Bible study 
that we had going on there for, I guess, about 20 weeks or so. And uh, we'll be beginning a brand new study on this coming Wednesday evening, so please keep that in mind uh, if you would. And uh, then next Sunday, uh, we are going to be taking the sign off of the door that says that our services are limited right now. And we want folks to come that can feel like they can come and be here and be a part of the service. And I just want you to know we're going to play it safe for you. Uh, the auditorium will be wiped down and disinfected. The air, by the way, will be disinfected just like it was this afternoon. I ran the sanitizer all afternoon when I got here a little bit earlier than, it was, than I was supposed to. And the sanitizer was still going, so I got sanitized. Just want you to know that I'm perfectly squeaky clean tonight. And I'll be running that on next Sunday before the service and on Saturday before, the, before Sunday. And then, of course, on Sunday afternoon and all will be well. And we will not be running our children's ministries. We will be having church at 1045. No Sunday school, no bus route, no van route. And uh, we'll be having folks here in the auditorium. And uh, we'll let you know when things will go back to Sunday school with the 9.45 and the 10.45 and then the evening service. And we'll keep you informed on all of that. If you feel as though you can come, we want you to come. Bring your mask, bring yourself. We'll have the place all cleaned and ready to go for you. And if you feel as though you cannot come, there's no pressure on you to show up. And I just want you to know that. No pressure whatsoever. Uh, I'm hoping that folks around this country don't get used to not being in church. And I really mean that with all of my heart. I don't think we have anything to worry about with our Timberline folks. You guys like coming to church and you love being here. And I don't think you'd miss it if your life depended on it. And I know that you're chomping at the bit to get back here. And that's what we want you to do because we're chomping at the bit to have you get back. But if you feel that you can't come, there's no pressure on you to come. Please understand that. And then I just wanted to remind you once again, as I have been doing, please don't get tired of these announcements. But if you need tracks or a track wallet, we got plenty here. Literally, we have thousands of gospel tracks. And right now, here we are. We're coming into this season of the year, and Mother's Day is coming. And before you know it, Father's Day is going to be here. And uh, by the way, I've been talking with Brother Randy Casey. And Brother Casey's going to do everything he can to be here in June for our 30th anniversary Sunday and preach that week from Sunday through Wednesday. And uh, right now, there's a couple of things pending but he wants to come. He's already said that he would if he could. And so I believe he's planning on it, barring anything that God might throw in the way. And I wanted you to be aware of that. Thanks also for being faithful in your tithes and offerings. You know, this boat has to float regardless of what's going on outside there. And I just want to thank you for being so faithful. I said this morning, all the bills are paid in full, on time, just like they ought to be. And that's because of your faithfulness and God's sweet blessing. And I want to thank you for that. And then there's just uh, three prayer requests that I want to share with you tonight. First of all, Brother Darrell goes in tomorrow at 1030 to have his eye worked on. He'll have cataract surgery. And they've been putting it off for him uh, because of this uh, corona thing. And he'll be going in tomorrow morning. So you want to remember to pray for Brother Darrell Kelly. And also Brother Mick uh, Jackson, I'm sure they are watching tonight. Uh, Brother Mick had his uh, biopsy, I uh, should say the tumor removal from his bladder on this last week, and he's doing well. And we got to see him the other day, and uh, we took some uh, food over to him, and, and boy, were they happy because Be Beverly said, we are hungry. And uh, they were very hungry. It was a very long day for them, and so we got to see them. And also, Greg Glover, or Glover, I guess I need to pronounce it, uh, this is the uh, friend of uh, the Snyders. Uh, Irma told me this morning he's now off the ventilator, he's no longer in ICU, and he's in a regular room, and all that's from the coronavirus that he was diagnosed with. So we praise the Lord for answered prayer on that, and uh, thank you, Irma and Dale, for sharing that, and what a great blessing that is. I believe that's all the announcements that I have, but you also have another song on the back of the song sheet that I gave you. It's Psalm 25, verses 1 through 4, and then verse 7, and I'm going to have to teach it to you tonight. Alrighty, because it's more or less an echo thing, and I'm going to sing the main part, and you're going to sing the echo, and then you're going to sing with me on part of it. So let me get my guitar, and we'll go through it tonight. <clears throat> This has always been one of my favorite scripture songs, 
And it goes like this, and uh, let me sing it for you. And as a number of folks who are watching tonight online, you learned this song a long time ago. And so you can sing along, but I have to teach it now to my church family so that we get it right uh, tonight, okay? It goes like this, unto thee, O Lord. And then there's an echo, unto thee, O Lord. And then I sing, do I lift up my soul? And you sing, do I lift up my soul? I sing, unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul? Do I lift up my soul? And then we sing together. Uh, I sing, Oh my God. And you sing, Oh my God. And then I sing, I trust in thee. And you sing, I trust in thee. And then we sing together, Oh, let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Think you got that down? With your masks on, you're going to have to sing it just a little bit louder. And that way I'll hear you. Let's sing it, shall we? And it does this whole thing all the way down with all of these verses, all right? Psalm 25, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then verse 7. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul, oh my God, I trust in Thee, oh let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me, yea let none that way on Thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that way on thee be ashamed. Oh, my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Show me thy way. My ways, O oh Lord, teach me thy path. Thy path, O oh Lord, O oh my God, I trust in thee. Oh, let me not be ashamed, not my enemies triumph over me. Remember not the sins of my youth. Remember not the sins of my youth. Oh my God, I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph. Isn't that a wonderful song? The way that I first taught it was we, the guys sang with me and the girls all sang the echo. And it was just always a nice chorus to sing. We'll sing that one again sometime soon, all right? And by the way, with your masks on, you did a great job. That's wonderful. All righty. I love scripture songs, or had you figured that out by now? I love scripture songs. And tonight I'm going to invite you, if you would please, to take your Bibles, and I'd like you to turn to the book of Ephesians, or excuse me, the book of Philippians, please. The book of Philippians, chapter 4. The Lord has given us a good day. We were able to get this morning's message up. I believe, uh, within 15 minutes of the end of the service. So the folks can listen to it online or download it there or whatever they want to do. And the same thing will be true tonight. This service will be uploaded onto our website. Tomorrow, both of these services will be uploaded to our YouTube page. And uh, those folks that don't have, uh, <clears throat> that don't have uh, Facebook, you can let them know that they can watch online as well. 
And so we're very, very thankful for the medium that God has given to us to be able to still preach the Word of God, teach the Word of God, fellowship with one another. And my goodness, what a wonderful spirit you all are brought with you every single service. I can't even tell you how grateful I am, the marvelous spirit that you carried with you. Shall we stand, please? Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Let's read together on verse 1, and then you read with me every other verse down through verse 5. Everyone now. Therefore, my beloved, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodias and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, Father, I just pray that you'd help me tonight, and I obviously need that help, and I pray that you would help me as I bring a truth that's along the lines of what we learned this morning about worry. And I pray, Lord, you would reinforce the faith that you have given us, and I pray, Lord, we could grow tonight, and I ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. And you may be seated. Tonight's message is very simply entitled, Is There a Cause for Worry? You know, in the Old Testament, there's a story of David coming down to fight with uh, the Philistine army and Goliath, and he asks his brothers, asks the king, Is there not a cause? And of course, there was a cause. Well, tonight, is there a cause for worry? Is there a cause for worry? If the truth be known, we are living in troublesome times. No one can argue that. We look around and see what's going on in the world, and Jamie Daly and Darren Vincent penned the lyrics to the song, Jesus is Coming Soon. Some of those words are these, Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear now is at stake. Maybe the song is prophetic in its message, but certainly troublesome times are here. And Paul wrote this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Uh, we're living in those days. I do not believe it will be long before the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And yes, I comfort myself with those words, and I trust that the Lord comforts your heart as well. But the question is this, even though we're living in perilous times, even though we are living in troublesome times, is there a cause for worry? What is it that causes worry? Many things, I suppose. Our English word, and this is, in, this is interesting, our English word for worry comes from an old word, which means this. It means to strangle, literally to strangle. Worry can certainly choke the life out of its victims physically, mentally, and even spiritually. And when the Bible uses the word careful and the Bible uses the word anxious, it is speaking of worry. Be careful for nothing. Be not anxious, you see. And they literally mean this. Don't miss this. They mean to be torn apart. Literally torn apart. Worry comes when the thoughts uh, in our minds and the feelings in our hearts pull in different directions and literally tear us apart. As a pastor, I've seen it many times. Worry has torn people apart. It's torn apart not only their lives, but it's also torn apart the lives of their family members. A husband or a wife gets to worrying and, and then suddenly their worry becomes a, a drag and a rag on their, on their spouse and it begins to tear the husband and wife apart. Why? Because it, that's what worry does. It tears things apart. And then the kids come and they say, what's wrong? And of course the parents always answer, oh, nothing. And the kids know better. You see, they're not dummies. They know better. No child has ever walked away from a parent who's been torn apart from worry. And the parent said, oh, nothing. And the child was totally satisfied that nothing was wrong. It's never happened in the history of children. It's never happened. It tears families apart. 
It tears apart our security. It tears apart our jobs. It tears apart all of these things. Pastors get worried about ministry. They get worried about finances of all things. Thank God I quit worrying about finances when we were up in Woodland Park. If I may share the story that I've shared a few times over the years, but I remember that we were not going to meet budget and we needed to have quite a bit of money to meet budget and pay Brother Penn and myself and all the rest of it and money was not there. And I remember that I sought advice from a sweet and a good friend and uh, he said, you need to tell your people. And I'm thinking, you just don't know the kind of people that we have. We don't have anybody in our church that has money. They tithe and they don't give till it hurts. They give while they bleed. That's just the way Timberline's always been. But he said, you really need to talk to your people. So I did. And I put out a plea that morning on a Sunday morning. And I think it was an extra $200 that came in. We never did meet budget. We never did meet budget on that day, I should say. And I remember how awful I felt about that. But I do remember over the next 24 hours how the Lord provided, without having to ask for a penny, how the Lord had provided everything that we needed. I'll not go into those details, but I'm just going to say we, meet, we met and we exceeded budget uh, to no fault of our own. It was strictly what God had done. And I swore that day that I would never worry about finances ever again. I do not want to be a part of a ministry that God does not invest in personally. That's just the way I am. And uh, I decided if God's not interested in it, neither am I. But now nearly 30 years have passed and God has met every need. And God has been gracious to us in every way. I don't worry about finances. It's just not something that I do. It tears up, uh, pastors quit ministries because of finances. They, they get torn apart because of conflict within the church. And we read about Iodius and Syntyche a moment ago. That kind of a problem would have driven many pastors away from their pulpit. Why? Because he had two women who wouldn't get along with one another. You know, uh, Brother Penn and I were chatting, and I love this about him. He always thinks through stuff more than I do. And that's the teacher in him, and that's a good balance that he and I have. But we were talking one day, and God, the Bible says that God removes our iniquities as far from the east is from the west and buries them in the depths of the sea, puts them behind his back and remembers them no more. And he said, what about Iodius and Syntyche, whose sins are recorded in the Bible and forever remembered? And I thought, oh yeah, that's right. I wouldn't have wanted to been either one of them women. But you know, their difficulty would have caused many pastors to quit. And when we've had people in Timberline Baptist Church over the years that haven't gotten along with one another... It tears me up, not enough to quit, but it tears me up, literally tears me up, tears me apart on the inside. And uh, the mind thinks about problems and, the, and this feeds additional feelings into the heart and this begins a vicious, vicious circle and the Bible says in Proverbs 23 and verse 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now I want to make a strange and a strong statement and I'm going to be misunderstood, but it is a sin to worry. Let me say it again, just in case you missed it. It is a sin to worry. That's right. The Bible admonishes us not to. It says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. You take the word nothing and divide it up and it means no thing. Be anxious in your heart. Worry about no thing. That's in a strong admonition from the Lord. And it means to worry is to be disobedient to the word of God. To worry about things is to disregard what God has written. He said, don't be anxious. Don't be full of anxiety. And today we have many people who suffer from anxiety attacks. I'm not convinced it's all physical. What I am saying is that people suffer from those. And I believe there's a biblical answer for, for, for it. And the Bible has it for us. And so none of us cares to live, listen, none of us cares to live there. So what can we do in order not to worry? We don't want to live in a state of worry all the time. Does the Bible give us an answer? Well, it's found right here in Philippians chapter 4, written by a man, by the way, who was sitting in prison. Understand that. Paul was not sitting at his desk with a candle burning and a, and a quill in his hand. He wasn't sitting there at home and enjoying a, a glass of tea or a cup of tea. He wasn't sitting there having had a, an evening snack. 
friend of mine asked me recently, he said, uh, what you going to be doing on Saturday night? And I said, I'm going to be doing this, and I'm going to pop some popcorn, and I'm going to drink some root beer. And that's exactly what I did last night. And I enjoyed the evening. Paul wasn't sitting there with a bowl of popcorn. He was sitting in prison. And he said these words. He simply said in Philippians chapter 4, he told us to rejoice. Very amazing. So let me give you these ingredients here that will help you with the sin of worry. Number one, if you're taking notes, God's presence. God's presence. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. We read it a moment ago. And with that context in your mind, listen to these words again. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved, I beseech Iodias and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Look at that last phrase. The Lord is at hand. Now that phrase means this, that he's near. It doesn't mean he's coming soon, though I believe that he is coming soon. But it's not referring to the soonness of his appearing. It's referring to his presence with us. The Lord is at hand. Eodius and Syntyche were at odds with one another, and they just simply could not get along with each other. And Paul encouraged them to make it right. And any preacher worth his salt will look at people in his church family who aren't getting along with each other, husbands and wives and wives and husbands and families and children and children and parents and friends and friends and members with members. He will, he will admonish them to get right with each other and be right with God rather than living in a constant state of turmoil. People say, well, I'm only hurting myself. That's, again, the lie that came from the pit of hell that people have believed for years that they think they're only hurting themselves. But if you think that nobody notices, I'm just here to tell you, people notice. We must understand that the Lord is with us, and he promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, he's at five he says, let your conversation uh, be without covetousness. He says, and be content with such things as ye have. But then it doesn't begin a new sentence. He uses the little word for. He's connecting the previous thought to what he's going to say next. And he says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God's cure for worry means that we should be living as though the Lord is close at hand. I mean, right here, right now. Somebody says you can run, but you can't hide. That's true. You can't. God is with us and he is omnipresent. And that means he's with you wherever you go in whatever situation you're in, whether you are sleeping at night or whether you are up in the daytime, that he does not sleep, nor doth he slumber, the word of God says. And so how do we, how do we live that way? Well, think about this. Uh, stand fast in the Lord. Decide you're not going to waver. When things go south in your life, decide the Lord is still there and that he has not forsaken you and quit shaking your fist up in heaven saying, what about me? Think about this, being one mind in the Lord, getting along with one another. There's something about going to church and you're unified with other believers. We've all been in a situation at one time or another where we've entered into a church and folks weren't getting along with one another. Somebody was bitter. Somebody was angry. Somebody wouldn't talk to you. Somebody wouldn't shake your hand. Somebody would ignore you or maybe they looked at you up and down and gave you one of those looks. And then there's the A team and the B team and the C team and the D team and they don't ever get along with one another. We've all been there. We've all been in situations like that. And brethren, these things ought not so to be. I don't know about you, but when I come to church, I love being here with the unity that I know with God's people. Does that mean we agree on everything and we dot every I and uh, cross every T exactly the same way? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean we get along with one another. Something else you do to live like the Lord is close at you, and that's rejoice in the Lord. 
I don't know what it is about testimony times in many churches, and we've not had one in a while because of all this. But you know what? I'm looking forward to the next one. I love it when people testify. I really do. And I listen, in this church, people stand up and say, I would want to thank the Lord that I got saved on such and such date, or I got saved in such and such, and such year, or I got saved in such and such month. Or, and that's all they say. That encourages my heart because they're praising the Lord. And the Bible says that God dwells in the midst of the praise of his people, rejoicing in the Lord and just realizing that God is there. He's close at hand. Just realizing he's there. Most folks, you know, out of sight, out of mind. It's not that way with the Lord. He's there whether you pay attention to him or not. It, listen, if we would rejoice in the Lord all way and get our eyes on him and off of people and off of our troubles, we would have joy and peace. And God promised that. Living as though Jesus were right there beside you literally will change your life. He's above you. He's beneath you. He's to the right hand. He's to the left hand. He's in front of you. He's behind you. As the songwriter put it, all of those places he is, and there is not a place that he is not. And just remember, he's there. He's there. People have said to me in years past, I just feel so alone. Well, that may be true with people, but you know the Lord is with you the entire time, you see. And uh, listen, the Bible says this. I love this. First John chapter 3 and verse 3. Living this way, it's like living with the sure hope that Jesus is returning. And I love this. And this is one of the strong reasons that I believe in the position that Jesus could come back tonight. Because he writes in 1 John 3 and verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And what was that hope? That was the blessed hope of Jesus' soon return. He said, if you have that, that you're living with that hope in your heart, it'll change your living. That's what it said. Let me read it again. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. He'll live right, you see because he believes Jesus is coming back and realizing that the Lord is at hand will utterly change your life. So the first thing I said to you about worry and is simply this is realize you have God's presence. Secondly, God's peace is available. Philippians chapter four, verses six through nine. Some of these verses you know by heart, others of them you've heard read, but I want you to hear in this context, I want you to hear them read again. The word of God says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned, uh, which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. He shall be with you. His peace is available. Peace, by the way, with God happens when you get saved. Your sins are atoned for. You are forgiven as a sinner. You have the assurance of heaven. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish have everlasting life. The Bible says that if you're, if you're saved, you'll not come into condemnation, but you're passed from death unto life. In the Bible that Peter wrote, he said that we are kept by the very power of God. Amen and amen. So you make peace with God by getting saved. But how do you get the peace of God? Because there's an awful lot of saved people today who live in constant turmoil and no peace in their hearts. And so the Bible says in Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified, uh, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So having the peace of God, though, is quite another matter. And that matter needs to be settled. 
And there are many today who have made peace with God simply because they have been saved. However, they live without peace in every other area. And we just read a moment ago that the peace of God will be with us. You see. And that's what we want as believers. Those who have made peace with God, we want the peace of God in our lives. And there are many today who've made that peace, but they don't have peace in their hearts. Not having peace in your heart does not in any way indicate that you're not saved. Please understand that. In fact, it may indicate that you simply are saved. Why? Because God does not give peace of mind to the Christian who does not pray, think, or live right. And that could be the reason that you don't have that peace. It's because maybe you're violating the God in that way. And he will remove your peace if you do not pray, think, live, and think and live right like you're supposed to. God's peace comes through praying right. God's peace comes by being obedient to him. That's like a, somebody that breaks the law. Think about this. There's lots of speeders out there, and boy, have there been a lot of accidents lately. I mean, as soon as this COVID thing was over with and stores started opening up, people started driving like maniacs. And before you know it, maybe they'll start driving safely again. But I mean, they passed me up on the pass like I was parked on the road. And I mean, it's like, get out of the way. And I said to Robin twice yesterday when we were out, I said, man, that guy behind me is trying to eat the, your bumper. And uh, there were two drivers that were doing that. And then we hear about these accidents over and over again. You know, uh, people just worry constantly and they have these things going on in their lives. But praying right, living right, doing right, a guy that's breaking the law is always looking over his shoulder. A guy that's speeding is always looking for the cop on the side of the road. He's always looking for that little area on Highway 24 coming down from Woodland Park where a, or a state trooper can park his car and hold his little light up to you or his, his, uh, his speed radar. Always looking for that. Somebody asked a long time ago, is there anybody whose conscience is so clear that as he's driving and he sees a policeman, he doesn't take his foot off the gas and look down at his speedometer? But I found a long time ago that if you don't speed, you don't have to worry about it. I wave at the policeman every morning when I go down. I like to wave at somebody that they pull over, but they're usually pretty busy. And the truth of the matter is, people that break the law are always looking over their shoulder. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. By the way, you pray right by including adoration. The word prayer includes adoring God, asking God, knowing that he's all-powerful. And you know, the thing is, uh, you pray right by supplication, the Bible said, through prayer and supplication. And here it means to give attention to personal, need, to, uh, personal needs rather than to God's sufficient to provide them. It means to pray with disregard for his ability. And you supplicate and you, and you beg God for what you need or what someone else needs. You pray right by application, and that means to give thanks always. Just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But learning to pray right, learning to give it what you've got in your prayers, and God's peace comes through thinking rightly, and it's not positive thinking. <laughs> it's not the power of positive thinking. It's right thinking biblically, and there's a difference, and the problem is heightened when the child of God fills his mind with wrong thoughts. Let me just read you some things that I wrote down. Thoughts that are not true will cause you to worry. Thoughts that are not honest will cause you to worry. Thoughts that are not just will cause you to worry. Thoughts that are not pure will cause you to worry. Thoughts that are not lovely or appealing in any way will cause you to worry. Thoughts that are not of good report will cause you to worry. That are not virtuous or not praiseworthy. All of these things will cause you to worry. And therefore, God, through the Apostle Paul, is encouraging us to have the right thinking. And you get that from the Word of God. And God's peace comes through living right. And you need to ask yourself this question. Is there something in my life that I will not pray about? If there's something you refuse to pray about, you'll never have peace. Because that means that you and God are at odds, you see. It's not enough to use the Bible as a basis for praying and claiming its promises. You have to also use it as a basis for your living and obeying what it says. Thirdly, I want you to notice this. Now, I said, first of all, about having this uh, not worrying kind of a life is God's presence. Secondly, is God's peace. But thirdly, I want you to notice God's power. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. You know, I, preachers don't preach much anymore about the power of God. If we do in this church... And you don't have to be in this church very long to know that the power of God is preached about because the Bible speaks of it. 
But the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. And here's the context of verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's not, I, have a, I, I can do all things. I can build a Sunday school class. I can build a bus route. I can build a church. I can do this. I can, I can. No, 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 no. It's about how you live. And did you notice what he said? I can be hungry. I can be full. I can be cold. I can be warm. I can be cared for. I cannot be cared for. I can suffer. I don't have to suffer. But I've learned that whatever state I am therewith to be content. And I can do all these things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And Paul had experienced just about everything negative that a person could experience. However, he had learned that in whatsoever state that he was in, didn't matter that he learned therewith to be content. And if we depend on our own power, we will fail. And if we depend on his strength, then we can do all things. And what causes a Christian to say that he can't take it anymore? I can't take it anymore. I'm done. I didn't sign up for this. I'm through. I quit. What causes them to say that? The Bible says that a Christian can endure all those things. Sirs, I believe God. Let God be true, but every man a liar. And he says it because he, listen, the Apostle Paul said this because he was living what the Word of God said. He says it because he is living in his own, listen, a man says, I can't take it anymore because he's living in his own strength. He's not living in the strength that God can give him. Because the truth is, in his own strength, he can't do all things because that strength will fail. What does it say back in, I believe it's the book of Deuteronomy or back in the Old Testament? It says that the arm of flesh will fail you, but underneath the everlasting arms, you see. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10 concerning his sickness, his, his eye problem, his thing that, that was debilitating for the ministry. He said, therefore, will I take pleasure in infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. You see, he wasn't depending on his own strength. He didn't have any. He was depending on the Lord. And then I want you to notice, lastly, God's provision. Philippians chapter 4, please, in verse 19. God's provision. I think most of us know this verse by heart, don't we? We've quoted it even though we didn't know where it was. We've heard it said to us even though we wondered where it was. But the Bible says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know, during this crisis time in America, that's a good verse to claim and live by. It really is. Because when you are without and when you are weak, then you can be strong in God. Jesus taught us in his Sermon on the Mount not to worry about things. I read these verses this morning, but let me read them to you again in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31, 32, and 33. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth ye have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. And realizing that God has the power to care for us should remove our worry. You see, when we were children, we get into a tiff with our friend and we'll say, well, my daddy can beat up your daddy because we had confidence in our daddy. Well, we ought to have confidence in our heavenly father, realizing that he's stronger than any enemy that we may face, you see. When the child of God is in the will of God, all the universe works for him. And when he's out of the will of God, everything works against him. The Bible says this in Romans 8, 28, 8, 28. And we know, that's a confidence. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So we understand these things, but do we believe these things? 
Now let me bring this message to a close tonight. What is your cause for worry? Is it a lack of knowing that the Lord is near at hand? He's meeting with us tonight. Every service in this church, I pray, Lord, meet with us. Meet with us. Teach us from your word. Meet with us, service after service. Is it a lack of praying, thinking, or living right? Is it a lack of trusting God's power or a lack of even trusting God's provision? How many, how many, how many times do I have to say it? All is well when the cabinets are full and the gas tank is full and the bills are paid and the health is good and all is well. God is always good in those situations. But what about when the cabinets are empty? And what about when the gas tank is empty? And what about when the bills are due and there's more month than there is money? Is suddenly God not good? I wrote to a friend just this afternoon as he had posted something on our, on our website or on our Facebook page. I said, God is good. And I sent to him Psalm 119, verse 68, where it said that he is good and does, and does good. He is good and does good. We've got to believe that. And so the Bible admonishes us not to worry. It says, be careful for nothing. And that means to worry is to be disobedient to the word of God. Let the Lord take care of and take away your worry. So is there a cause for worry? No, not really. And there are three biblical tra truths that I want to leave you with tonight and I'm done. Number one, God loves you and he only wants what's best for you. And when it says, my God shall supply all your need, that means your need may not always be financial. Your need may be, like Paul's worth, to go without so your trust is in him. He loves you, and he only wants what's best for you. Number two, he's omniscient, and he knows what's best for you. I don't know what's best for you, and you don't know what's best for you, but he knows everything, and he knows exactly what you need. And thirdly, he is omnipotent, and he is able to do what's best for you. We sing the song, he is able he is able, I know he is able, I know my God is able to carry me through. He is able, he is able, I know he is able, I know my God is able to carry me through. He heals the brokenhearted and he sets the captive free. He made the lame to walk again and he caused the blind to see. He is able. He is able, I know he is able. I think he's able to carry me through. No, he is able, and he's more than able. So is there a cause for worry? We think there is, but in reality, as a child of God, you've got the power of the universe behind you to help take care of you financially and physically and spiritually and emotionally, all those things are cared for. You say, Pastor, that's easy for you to say. You're a preacher. <laughs> that's not easy for me to say, but I can read it. I may not be smart in a lot of areas, but I can read. And everything I read to you tonight from the Word of God is word for word true. I hope you believe it. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the promises that are found in the Word of God. As the Apostle Paul wrote and said, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Lord, help us to believe you. Oh, Lord, work in us. This world has given us so many things to worry about, but there's not really a cause for worry. And Lord, we, we even learned this morning that there's a difference between concern and worry because worry will immobilize us. But concern will move us. So help us, Lord, to learn the difference. And Lord, that we might ask for forgiveness about our lack of faith and trust in you. Our heads are bowed. Pastor, I'm the one that needed the message tonight. You didn't write it for me. But I'm the one. Slip your hand up real high. Let me pray for you tonight. God bless your hearts. You dear folks at home, what about you? You folks who are listening online, what about you? Is your hand up tonight? May I pray for you as well, and I promise that I will. 
I do not know who all of you are necessarily, but I can still pray for you. you say, well, what do I do about that, Pastor? I've heard men say, don't ever tell God you're sorry. <laughs> I disagree with that. Tell God you're sorry. And then ask him to help you. Ask him to forgive you. And get up and go on anyhow. That's what you're supposed to do. Father, bless now each individual today, whether they be here in this room or whether they be uh, at home sitting on a couch or a chair or at a table or at a desk, watching on a phone or a TV or a computer screen. I pray, dear Lord, that you give them that same wherewithal tonight, that they'll believe what you said and let God be true and let every man be a liar. Lord, help us to trust you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're glad you came this evening, say amen. amen. And it's been good to have you here. Thank you so very, very much. Soon we're going to be back to a semi-normal schedule starting on next Sunday on Mother's Day. Following the morning service, we're going to have donuts and milk and coffee in the fellowship hall for anybody that would like to have some of those. And so we want everybody to come that can come next week. Don't forget your mask. And we'll have the whole place cleaned and, of course, sanitized for you. We want you to know it's a safe place for you to be. You folks that live a long way from us, why don't you get on a plane and fly up here and enjoy a donut with us? How does that sound? And uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a grand old time on next Sunday, that's for sure. But we're going to be back here on Wednesday evening with another Bible study. That'll be at 7 o'clock. So I hope you can be in your place on time, just like you ought to be. And the Lord will bless with his wonderful presence.